no, 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 no. I bum out. I promise you. It's all right. Just sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Just taking a bit more. Awesome. I'm not sure how we're focusing this one. I'm sorry. We know that. Do you want to lead it, and I'll maybe follow your lead a bit? I mean, all we know is. We know we both found it a very interesting conversation. Yeah. And there's stuff to unpack. I've got no idea how you want to unpack it, but I thought bro, bro I rather we were both fans. I rather get your because you took notes, but I, I was attending the event, so it's more mental in my head. Okay. So maybe if we like you cover a point, I give my input, and then we go back and forth. But it'd be, it'd be good to cover what you're saying. What I got from it was. If I shoot through, there's quite a lot here, and then you'll get a sense of the menu of things I thought they talked about. There were discussions on epistemology, which you and I were talking about before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what I'd like to come back to. Sure. And there was a feeling that Peterson was more of a pragmatist, and you guys are more into correspondence theory. And I mean, he does more into correspondence theory. And I remember when you and I spoke, you said to me, so you agree with correspondence theory, and I queried that. And then we lost that thread and didn't continue. We could come back to that. Sometime. Sure. What would be good, Tony, is yeah. you, you cover, say, epistemology, we go back and forth, whether we agree or disagree, then we go to the next topic. Yeah, well, so I'll be give, good. let me give you the others just so you know. Then there was how much the, the second, so the first one was epistemology. The second one was how important the objective truth of something in a religious book is relative to its mythological impact. So Peterson took Cain and Abel and he went, yeah, it may have happened as a physical event, but what may be even more interesting, and I agree with him, is that it's a psychological archetype for the human condition. It's a perennial story of the human psyche. Yeah? So how much is it important where something objectively actually happens, whereas how um, relative to its mythological value and merit yeah i like that okay yeah. so that's another point of contention sure. where i'm an extreme liberal sure yeah i think it's all about the mythology and the story mm -hmm. and i don't even particularly care about the objective stuff so much um what else came up because uh, right then i got confused i got confused i don't know what you thought with their view of postmodernism they seem to come to a point where they agreed that postmodernism meant querying your how you know anything in the first place like um the work of phrase the question was asked, how do we know God exists? Peterson went, well, it depends what you mean by the key words like, no, you, God, yeah? And he and Muhammad Hijab seemed to concur that this was sort of a postmodern trend towards deconstructing words. And here I fell apart with both of them, because to me that's healthy skepticism, not postmodern. Yeah, so let's discuss that, because I have some thoughts on that. Quite strong thoughts. Okay. Well, as well, or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, we so, can remember so, them so, and come back. So, so, how many is it? A, B. Epistemology, the truth of object, objectivity versus mythology, definitions of postmodernism, the elephant in the room we don't need to go to, what the hell, uh, consensus version of truth, that's a deep one, forget it. Let's start, we'll okay, see how so it rolls, because we've got until we've got about two hours yeah of course yeah so where would you like to go on if, if you could stand there i'm um, sorry what's your name christian christian good to meet you Sabur. yeah okay and, good uh, the last thing if you stand a bit closer because or, or we can get you to wear a mic uh, yeah yeah sorry hi i haven't got a mic so i can give you a we're good. Are we good? Okay, I'll stand like this and we'll kind of... The last of the four things, so we've got three. The fourth thing, the thing that I personally love, was near the end Peterson gave um, a narrative view of Christianity as telling the ultimate tragedy of the human condition. And I think there he's bang on board. Yeah, He said it's the most frightening thing you can look at as told in the story of Christ. And I really love that Muhammad Hijab seemed to respond to that and seem merited. Yeah? Because to me that cuts to the heart of why Christianity has such power and should be taken seriously. It's not deconstructing the Trinity and all this stuff. It's seeing what Peterson's revealing in that insight. And I love that Muhammad Hijab responded to that positively. So as a meeting of minds on common themes, it was all great. And I was sure. more than happy. And it would be nice if you start off with why you enjoyed this rather than the second one. You mean the 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 second one rather than the first one. Well, I'm trying not to be negative if I don't have to be. No, 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 okay. no it's okay. fine, okay. it's in fine. No, in truth, I f should I be really, really true? I'll be really, really true. I actually thought that maybe the Peterson Muhammad Hijab thing was never going to happen. I suspected, part of me suspected it might be a height. Okay? And I like Muhammad Hijab, I'll say that now, having spoken with him privately off camera, I actually think he's a very nice guy. Okay? Um, but I suspected it might have been height, so I was really surprised when it happened. 
yeah. okay, to be honest. Um, when it did happen, I was really excited for it. And then I found there was no chemistry at all. I didn't think that anything particularly contentious was touched on. I thought Peterson wasn't digging in the way he normally does. He was just listening, which he's an advocate of. He says, I want to listen. And um, I thought it was very brave of Muhammad Hijab to do the singing and all of this stuff. But essentially, that I didn't think there was much philosophical meat in it. Sure. This one, I think there was a lot of philosophical meat and there was chemistry and it was all good. And that was the difference. Okay, good. Okay, good. What do you think? Yeah, fantastic. Let's, uh, should we begin? I thought we had. Oh, we thought we had. <laughs> okay, no, because the way, the way, um, okay. the way, the way we wanted to uh, start it yeah. was... It may be better to categorize the points and say we're going to cover A, B, C, D. We're going to cover epistemology, correspondence theory, um, something about Christ, uh, the, the last thing. Objective truth versus mythological truth, where is more value? Um, and definitions of postmodernism that you and I seem to have. Fine. It doesn't have a handle. Should I put it in between the two? Or? Yeah, yeah, you see, I, um, I can hold it. Okay. Can I put this here? Just want to make sure it doesn't drop. I'll hold it in my hand. Really? So listen, dude, if you want to sort of steer the conversation, I've given you what's on my brain, but I'm quite tired, frazzled. I'm doing stuff today. I've got legal stuff, so I might not be as fluent. That's all right. So I can trust you to... Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so let's, let's start off with the... The first point, which was the chemistry of this one was yeah. better than the last one. Yeah. Do you think that's due to the first one being perhaps an ice-breaking session? Yeah. And the second one is like, okay, they understood each other and there yeah. was mutual respect. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. And again, as I've said, I like Muhammad Hijab having spoken to him off camera. Um, I find him a very different person off camera, potentially, to the way he may come on the camera. And I thought after the first one, there may have been quite a lot of negatives about Muhammad Hijab fed into Peterson's ear, based on other things that had happened, yeah. um, which you're probably aware of. The elephant so, in the room. <laughs> right, right, right. So I was really quite surprised to see Jordan Peterson re-engage, because Muhammad Hijab had one with his daughter, and that was highly fractious. Yeah? So I thought a lot of stuff would have fed back, and I was... I'm sure he saw that. Huh? I'm sure he saw that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he saw yeah. that. I'm sure he had a chat with his daughter. I'm sure a lot of people were saying to him, this guy's very contentious, and you may have misread him. So the fact Peterson went back, I commend him for, but the fact that it then went so well, and he seemed to actually have a chemistry with my manager, and respect the fact that he is quiet and... You know, he says you're not an agreeable guy, you're a disagreeable guy. Yeah. But Peterson can see some merit in that as well. Now, I'm not saying I'm always flying the flag when anybody, including Muhammad Hijab, is disagreeable, because I'm not. But the fact that you can appreciate that has its place. I like him, Peterson. So that surprised me. Okay, cool. good. So on that point, I think let's just begin off with the, the mindset that Jordan Peterson went into the discussion. I think the first one, he didn't know who the guy was. Yeah. And the second one, here's somebody who totally comes from a different tradition, yeah. totally disagrees on some points in a very strong way, and is being honest. Yeah. Because I think one of the problems that people like Peterson have is they don't like someone who has an agenda who's trying to hide what they're doing. So very clearly, uh, Hijab was saying to him that you should accept Islam. Yeah. Hijab was saying to him, this is why Islam is true. Hijab was saying to him, your, um, you know, your, your critique in this particular area is incoherent. And that kind of direct, blunt criticism is refreshing for most people. I think that's why they had a chemistry. I'm not clear where he was up front saying your critique is not is intelligent. No, no, as in when Hijab asked, do you believe in God? And he said, it depends what you mean, mean by, by, the words by the words you, you, you do. do. Yeah. Even do, he took it. Yeah, right? which was a bit... Uh, and believe. And believe, yeah. and God. And he's totally correct, but what interested me then... Okay, no, but, but let me just explain why, uh, why that was uh, um, incoherent, why Hijab was re rebuffing that point. Because when it comes to things like studies about STEM, 
about science, technology, edu uh, and uh, engineering and uh, mathematics, you know, he would use evidence from that against feminists. So he would say, no, women, um, you know, they have uh, the choice, but they refuse to go to these particular universities. Here's the data, very clear cut evidence. But when it comes to these questions, he's being pedantic about what does this term mean, what does that term mean, but he doesn't apply that same criteria to when he's discussing things with feminists. And that is what hijab was calling a postmodern, you're going all postmodern now, you see. And I like the I, fact that he challenged him on that. I, I do, but I thought they both concurred it was a postmodern thing to do. However, what hijab was raising is why are you doing it in this context? Okay, I could answer that. I, I don't have a problem answering that at all, because I okay. think when you're talking about feminist activity in the 21st century, you can measure it objectively. Feminists are objects in an objective world. You can get to core facts, yeah? There are facts to be dug up. When you're talking about God, God is ineffable. The same constraints do not apply. You have to question your own epistemology more, because ultimately, I would argue, your epistemology can't grasp God. God is ineffable. Um, and but don't, not, God is not the same as a feminist. No, no, no. I, I, a very different no, no, no. Of, I see what you're saying, but it doesn't it doesn't explain the fact that he's being asked a question about his beliefs, which are yes or no, which are quite simple. And instead, he sort of meanders off into what does this mean, what does that mean? Do you see? That's the problem here. If he, if he said, okay, what, do you, what I mean by belief is X. What I mean is um, the, the tripod. Uh, the uh, what's, what's it called the, the no the the Aristotle sort of definition of knowledge, right? So knowledge, uh, true justified belief. You know, he, like he could have said, okay, this is what I mean. According to that, yes or no, I believe in God or I don't believe in God. Instead, he just went off into definitions and then did on address the question. I think that's. I know why it can look that way, but this cuts to the And he took, a, he took a lot of flack for that online, from everybody. I, from, I from Christians, I from atheists. I wouldn't support that flack, sorry. Okay. I'm in a camp where I think, as I said, God is ineffable. I think epistemology and knowledge and asking for, um, yes no questions can take you to a certain point. It's a very valuable tool. But there's a pre-intellectual, a priori condition of instinct which is essentially mystical and undefinable, and I wouldn't expect to be able to nail reality down at that level. Okay, Whereas so you seem to think that you can. I'm, conservative religious people seem to think that they can literally, cognitively, almost mathematically and logically, dissect the whole metaphysics. And I assume that the metaphysics is built with a mystical structure at the top, and that you can use um, inference and logic to carry you a certain height up there. But at the very highest echelon, you're going to move on faith, which is how it should which is why you need faith. So I don't, I don't disagree in some of what you're saying. What you're basically referring to is what philosophers call academic throat clearing. So yeah. So you're you're, you're basically clearing the air with what the definitions actually mean. However, that doesn't negate the duty that you have to address the question that you're being asked, which is very clear. And the question is, and we're going to need, we're need some. Yeah, we prob pro we'll probably need one. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm good for... I'm good. I, I, I don't really have a problem with you. I have a problem. I do have a problem. Okay. This frontline debate. In Just when we're getting juicy. This is in the trenches discussion. It, Get it is. Broadly. It Let's is. Go. Thank you. So, um, I honestly don't think I'm ducking the question. I, no, no, I'm not saying you're ducking the question. Okay. I'm saying Peterson could have had that academic throat clearing. For example, yeah. do you remember that conversation, Tony, that... Do you remember that conversation we had over there? Yeah. What you did in that conversation, and it's um, online, it's very clear for anybody to see. Yeah. You went through your academic throat clearing, and then you were clear on what your stance is. With Peterson, he didn't do the second part. That's By what I mean. Clearing, do you mean define your terms? Go beyond defining your terms. You, you made it clear that you believe uh, is pragmatically useful to believe in God. And you were very clear on that. Uh, actually, I'm not sure I did. Are you inferring that because I because I seem to be refuting correspondence theory that therefore I must be accepting... No, practices? when you said that your entire um, view of God yeah. is, is that 
you, you don't see it in black or white terms of whether God exists, but you do believe it's useful to believe in God, it's instrumentally useful. And yeah, you are, doesn't, that doesn't mean it's the sum of its potential merit. It means no, at, I'm not at saying minimum that. it has pragmatic utility. Yeah. I think it's deeper than that. No, it is. But what you did is you explained this is your belief. Yeah. That you believe it to be useful uh -huh. and therefore people who actually believe in God are going to have, say, better lives, right? Peterson doesn't, he alludes to that, yeah. but he's, it's, it's almost like um, he hides his beliefs. He, he keeps his cards close to his chest. He's not clear on where he stands. So, for example, is he a Christian? If I was to ask you if he's a Christian, actually, let's ask Christian because he's supposed to be having a conversation with us. Would you say that Jordan Peterson is a Christian? Um, in, a, in the sense that I think he sees the fundamental value in the more mythological and transcendental, say, archetypal um, framing of a lot of those texts, the New Testament, the Old Testament, and so on. I think he sees a value there as a, as a psychologist. Right. I don't know whether he believes, in, for example, in Jesus Christ the person, or that a lot of the Old Testament, uh, you know, the stories from the Old Testament, that they're necessarily true. Right. I think he's probably more of a pragmatist. Than so he can't technically be a Christian. No, I think you're. I think, no, I think you're, you're, you're right. preempting a definition of being a Christian. You're, right. get, you're thinking that you can define the box everyone has to sit in, and if somebody goes, "No, I see profound merit in this narrative outside," if you look at it from outside that particular box, you then deny them the right to assert that particular perspective and faith. I agree, but there, there are limits, though. There, are, there are limits, but so I'm saying, look, you can't always say. You can't get five Christians and always get them to agree what is the definition of Christianity. Uh -huh. What you can do is the negation, which is they don't believe in um, Ganesh. Yeah, sure. So you can do that. So with him, he's not clear in his position. And that that's what um, I think, uh, for example, I was watching this channel, uh, I think Majority Report, it's, I, th I think it's, it's a Atheist. Um, and they were picking up on that conversation. Uh, where he's being asked about God, he's not answering. And then many different people, Christians, Muslims, atheists, all that's one of the main things shared from the video, that uh -huh. he doesn't answer the question. A lot of people are frustrated at that. Okay, I, I disagree. I think he's totally answering the question. It's just he doesn't he wouldn't concur with the context within which the question is framed. And this was touched on in their discussion about Cain and Abel. Right. You remember? Yeah. He gave the example of Cain and Abel. Happening. Now you can look at the Cain and Abel story two ways. You can look at it from, and they're both valid. You can look at it from the point of view of historically, did it happen as a point of objective reality? Sorry, it's like, yeah. Or you could, and Peterson said you can look at it that way. But the second way to look at it is for the, it's describing the eternal conflict in the human psyche. Yeah? That it's psychologically an eternal verity. It's archetypally true. So if you accept it's got those two properties, the archetypal truth of the human condition and the historical objective fact, and then you triage them and go, which do we think is of more spiritual merit in terms of helping me to live my life, yeah? In terms of addressing the human condition. I think the eternal archetypal aspect of it is more potent and more relevant. So, if, in other words, if the historical truth turned out to be the case that the archetypal story had no merit, it wouldn't be of much interest. However, if the archetypal story has merit, just because the historical truth doesn't, it doesn't downgrade the merit of the story. So he is focusing totally on the impact of the narrative of an archetypal Jungian kind of level. And the story he gave of the Christ story, his perspective on Christ as being the ultimate horror story of the human condition, I think cuts to the heart of what a lot of Christians may be unconscious in sensing, even if they're not articulated it that way. Um, the fragility of the human condition and that you have to confront the worst. Yeah? And Christianity does a rather uniquely good job of that. I'm not saying to the exclusion of any other religions, they all touch on this, but Christianity with the symbol of the cross and the crucifixion, as he pointed out, really does push that in your face and go stare at the horror of your condition. And I think God's agreeing with me on this point. That was a powerful I think thunder. In, an orthodox, in like a formal orthodox view in Christianity, yeah. the, the view that so many religious you need to come a bit closer. And, and Muslims take, obviously I'd say the Christians don't believe in to be. You're uh, actually, you might as well come in. Yeah, if you're going to, okay, yeah, otherwise you're the back of the head. Yeah, yeah, you got you. Okay. Um, so I can see where there's, there are going to be differing opinions about Peterson's orthodoxy yeah. is really, you know, this is Catholic. Um, 
but I think you're very right. it's true. I think there there are so many adumbrations and, and levels and a richness there of the archetypal kind of framework that people can all relate to. I think that's where his crystal could, couldn't we I mean if we were to stretch it that far, the way that you explained it and you're saying that he's fine in doing that. Then we could also say that Harry Potter is another archetype. Yeah. And that is a true yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. But the problem there is... No, 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 hang on. We wouldn't say it was a true story. The dynamics a true from true. a pragmatic point of view. It's happening now. Okay, so if you're using truth as opposed to factual... I'm, then I'm using yeah, his yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah. So what's happening in that school... I, I mean, I haven't read Harry Potter. I haven't seen the films either. But whatever the name of that school is, I've heard the name of the school. Um, uh, so th that is happening right now in Speaker's Corner. Yeah. You know, between um, Harry and whatever the other witches or whatever they are. Um, you can tell I, I read the book. Um, that's happening right now between me and Tony, between me and Christian. Do you see? And the problem there is that it's stretched so far, you can't actually identify as anything. You can't, if you're asking the question, what is objectively and historically true, you've got to identify what is your key question. I'm, I'm always saying this. Your answer can only be as good as your question. What is your key question? The key question I'm always asking is how should I live? Okay? That's my first question. Right. Okay? Now, if that's not your first question, we're inevitably going to end up coming up with different answers. What if I was to say, how do I know what's true? Well, I would say that if I ask the question, very good, if I would say that if I ask the question, how should I live, almost instantly it invites the next question, how do I know what's true? Okay? But the question, how do I live, is the motive behind asking that next question. But it can also be the other way around. It could be. So, great. So, in, in the hierarchy of which of those questions is primary, I think how do I live is more primary because I think how do I live is an eternal question that every human being who's ever been born or whoever will be born will have to face and which is precisely why the religions in all cultures have generated answers to that core in, up question and one of the next questions it then invites inevitably is how do you know? what the hell's going on yeah however the issue there is if you start off with your question uh -huh. pragmatism is the paradigm my question would be a correspondence theory of truth that would be your paradigm I'm, I'm not anti-correspondence theory at all. I'm not I'm saying you are. I'm saying th there's, there'll be two different paradigms from which you start if the questions are in that order. I'm saying that I think you've got to, you've got to separate your inevitabilities from your options, from your contingencies, yeah? Right. And I think asking the question, how do I live, is an inevitable question for all human beings for all time. You ask it unconsciously. It doesn't have to be articulated. Same, same with the, how do I know it's true? This is your... Okay, on that one you're right, but that very quickly we do start moving into questions of physics and metaphysics. So you don't inevitably have to engage with in order to answer the question, how do I live? Yeah? It's, it's an advantage to, no question, but it's not absolutely inevitable. If you're a wise person, you will, but yeah. you don't have to. But you are compelled to make choices. I have no choice but to make choices, so I've got to ask primarily, on what basis do I make choices? You're right, then you try and work out where am I, what are the rules, what's going on. Um, you seem to be framing your stuff within trying to nail down objective reality. And I just, it's a statement of faith almost. If you really think that you... What, but don't you, think, don't you think all worldviews start off from some level of faith? Yeah, I think this is the point. We know yeah. from... So we you agree before, that? Yeah, Gödel's incompleteness theory, Hume's fallacy of induction, quantum physics, they all show that there are limits to epistemologically what you can grasp. Yeah. You shouldn't conclude from that the epistemol um, epistemology has no merit or it isn't the most powerful tool. It's an incredibly powerful tool. It's just not a universal tool. Yeah. So once you understand yeah, that, agree, you realise, as Peterson does, that yeah. there'll come a point when you have when that tool is no longer available to you at the higher echelons of your experience you're going to have to go with faith you're going to have to go with intuition yeah. and then you can pragmatically look back and see how it went which is why he says i'll look for the shining example in other people yeah you're going to have to make a leap of faith act it out i'll look at you and see if your leap of faith works and if it does then you may have been heading in the right direction so at some level we, but this uh, yeah sorry Karen. No, Karen. well at some level you've ground down in pragmatism because there's nowhere honest left to go but that I said, the last part I don't agree with because you would still, for, for Jordan Peterson to decide by I look at the followers, he still has to have a criteria to decide these followers are flourishing, these are not. And that criteria has nothing to do with the question that he's trying to answer. Okay, yeah, no, we're in an eternal loop here. Again, he has to have faith. So that's fine. 
So we, we agree there? Yeah, I that, think all we've yeah. got to do is structure our arguments where we agree whether you're an atheist or not, your argument will include statements of faith. Now the that includes values, which you yeah, which yeah, basically... Yeah, down to, what, did I exist? Oh, I mean, very shortly into the second century, did Christ exist? Did this person even exist in human form? Lots of the earliest Christian fathers were having that argument with other Christians, other Gnostics and so on. The, what's cool about this, though, is it looks like Satan's gospel and reading saints gospel saints like saints gospel okay, sure. and reading into scripture old testament scripture was where a lot of these guys got their idea from christ from like the isaiah 53 you know the suffering um suffering heroes um i think what's important is that you take say if you're listening to the parables christ teaches or you listen to many of the ways he's, he's saying powerful moral stuff it's just as important today as it was back then and um, the, the parables again are, are they appear to be kind of timeless they never really you don't need to change them we're making movies we, we do Hollywood films today which are based in in large part on, on kind of Christian on those stories if you take the patriarchs as well yeah the, the Lion King and so on um, like uh, Star Wars is a good example of stories that are actually based on the kernel of... Anakin is happening right now. <laughs> yeah. You know what, it's yeah. quite well, it's, it gets esoteric and strange, right? But but, but the, those stories are encapsulate stuff and truths that are going to be eternal. I think that's what Peterson is trying to, to get. Yeah, I really. think Peterson understands that, and we had this discussion before, I think truth can exist in fiction. Yeah, yeah. And if you're that's where I disagree. Yeah. Truth, you disagree. Now remember, I I believe in correspondence theory. So I believe in correspondence theory. No, but I believe correspondence theory in terms of your beliefs, your values. Um, it, it, it's not like, you, for example, you would use correspondence theory if you want to know what's the best way of bulking up your muscles, right? So you'd look at scientific studies about protein synthesis and all this stuff. But when it comes to Religion, you would use a pragmatic view. No, 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 no. I, we're misunderstanding each other fundamentally. Okay. okay. I think in the hierarchy, pragmatism is below correspondence theory. Okay. Oh, I know good. That's good. Strange. I think pragmatism that's is good. below it. Okay, good. However, I because I too. think correspondence theory is based on epistemology. Come in. Yeah. It means there's limits to how far it can take. Okay. That's one caveat. The other caveat is, and it's a small print caveat, I was going to put the self-consistency principle above correspondence theory, because I think correspondence theory only looks for self-consistency in the present moment empirically. Right. That's really what it aims for. Whereas the self-consistency principle, you can project it into the future. In other words, it's even more powerful than correspondence theory. I'm actually bigging up correspondence theory. So as a practical example, I... Wouldn't you say that they're linked? I, I think because being consistent is part of be, part of a yeah they're both theory. they're both linked in Plato's, Plato's right. principles. Do you mind if I get facial to join yeah, this yeah, conversation? Yeah, yeah. No, it's you see he has a lot of very interesting things to say, but he just doesn't. Yeah, no, he's, talk. I know. We've chatted before. Talk. Come, come. Okay. No, just come listen. Come so listen. I think we all be at, we're all anchored in Plato's principle of self consistency. Yeah. yeah. When there's a, a contradiction between any two situations in a the system, then there's a problem, and the problem is either one of perception or or the system itself. Yeah. yeah. So we agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, the principle of correspondence theory makes perfect sense, and I agree with correspondence theory. I just think we're undervaluing its power, and that the I'm o overvaluing, undervaluing, it. undervaluing, okay. undervaluing its okay. power. Okay. Because I, my understanding of correspondence theory is it's about saying if in the here and now everything is self-consistent, I can trust that. I think you can go further and predict into the future, and that's beyond correspondence theory. That's self-consistency. You're just going, I have so much faith in self-consistency, I just don't think it's going to play out in the present, I'm confident it'll play out in the future. So on the periodic table, they predicted what elements would appear in the yeah. future because they were so confident of self-consistency in the universe. Now that didn't tell you with self-consistency for them in the moment, yeah? But because they put real jackboots on the self-consistency principle, they went, well, hedge our bets in the future that this element will appear here, this element will appear here. Ditto with the Higgs boson, and this still happens. So I have huge faith in correspondence theory, but it still has cognitive limitations. But they all do. Correspondence, right. coherence, Excellent. semantic, they all do. Excellent. Yeah. And when Shall we, because we laboured this point, should we move on to the other points? Sure. Yeah. Which one? So you had epistemology and after that you had something else. Because um, there's quite a few points you raised in there and I thought it'd be good to go through them. We had the epistemology, we had... Because in many ways we, we had 
a similar conversation before. It's rained all over. It's rained oh, all over dear. the notes. It's okay. Well, we we actually we were covering them. We had the Cain and the, the objective reality versus mythological reality. Yeah. Yeah? We which we're talking that. about. Yeah. We had the epistemology, which hopefully we've understood. Okay. What about the third one? The third one was the use of postmodernism. Because Good. they both seem, when at some point in the discussion, uh, Peterson said, what is the phrase, do you believe in God? Yeah? Yeah. And then he started deconstructing, it depends what you mean by you, what you mean by God, etc. Yeah? Yeah. And they both seemed to concur that that was a postmodern thing to do. And there I left, I departed from both of them, because to me that's just healthy skepticism. You were telling me last week about a postmodern book you were reading. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it makes perfect sense, right? because from my understanding, postmodern is all about deconstructing. The so it makes perfect sense what... They were both saying that is yeah, postmodern. Yeah, well, I thought Mohammed Jawa was saying because John Peterson was, you I have this Carl Jungian methodological understanding of Christianity, right? They're saying it's metaphorically true, right? But because the church fathers never said it was metaphorically true, it was literally true. Like Muslims nowadays would hold literally true to the miracles that we have. So then he's saying, by you doing this Carl Jung mix of Christianity, you're kind of being a postmodernist. Right. But the postmodernists, that's what they do, right? They take these legitimate narratives and then delegitimize and talk about how it has biases and this and that. It's just all about deconstruction. I think postmodern in itself is incoherent. I think it's ingenuine philosophy. But I think the tools he uses are very amazing. Okay, so, so just before that, do you agree with him that what they were saying was not postmodernism? He thinks that's skepticism. I disagree with that. I think that was both right. That was postmodernism. Okay, so how, how, would you, how would you define postmodernism and how would he? I'm, I think I'm that's... realizing I'm not clear how to define it. I go back to Plato's cave. I assume in Plato's cave, Plato is saying, and then I'll go through Descartes and I think that's where I am. So with Plato's cave, it's established. You cannot trust your own senses. You cannot trust your own cognition. You're a self-deceiving animal, and that's the framework within which you're going to have to operate. Yeah. The solution to that is skeptic. The tool to use to counter that is skepticism. Oh, I, I don't see why postmodernism is doing anything new. It's picking itself up as some kind of new thing. But actually, we know we have to question what we mean by the worst. It's a very yeah, healthy thing to do. It's a type skepticism, though. You're talking about Socratic skepticism, right? Yeah. Which is what the West is very big on. But postmodernists, like start in 96 or something, first it was post-structuralists. When I talk about history, when I took history apart, when I talk about history, it's all about narratives, Victor writes history, uh -huh. and, 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 and all stories have these four kind of modes. It's either tragic, or it's this, or it's that, or that. They kind of digitalize narratives. And the postmodernists came after the post-structuralists, Michael Foucault, they took it even further, right? So I delegitimizing de 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 these modern notions like of the prison system, of mental health, and la la. And so they're both different forms of skepticism, right? That's what but, they do, but, but how cogent. But the point is that when Joe Peterson says, when you say, do you believe in God? He goes, what do you mean by do? Because yeah. do is a very, like, I don't know, um, philosophical, metaphysical statement, right? Like, the yeah. theological statement, was, or right? Belief. Yeah, or the you. Well, who's the you? The I, the concept, philosophy again. I believe, know. God. That is very postmodern, in my opinion. Like, yeah. it's, it's deconstructing yeah. the yeah. sentence yeah. and, and talk about how. He's, he's almost saying the question's not even legitimate, isn't it? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? No, I mean, when I, I, I listen to postmodernist thinkers, I read a lot on postmodernism going back. I think there's a, there's a point where postmodernism kind of split from, say, Nietzsche. Was reasonable Wittgenstein as well, who had some interesting things to say about right. language and linguistics and so on. When by the time you get to Foucault and you know the um, Frankfurt School and stuff, it just goes a bit nuts. But I'm not, and I think yeah. it was more a yeah, he would say I'm, I'm not more a the political kind of uh, political series of ideas that, that actually started to, and I think intentionally were there to try and take down the American. System, the Western system. We're actually in agreement know? because I'm not legitimizing postmodernism. Like I said, I think it's incoherent yeah, right. in, in general philosophy, right? Because yeah. it, br it brings about some of the conceptual problems. But postmodern is still a reality. Like here in America right now, they're doing around right? critical race theory, they're doing of gender yeah, theory, genders, right? Yeah, Trying to blur the lines between man and woman, right? It's all postmodernist, post structuralist, patriarchy, yeah. uh, so oppressor versus oppressed so narrative, right? Because yeah. postmodern, a lot of it is the oppressor and oppressed. Yeah. Kind of so, so, di so this is what Hijab was basically saying to him that when you're being um, when you've been criticizing postmodernism, you're using it yourself yeah. when you cannot answer a question about your theology. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I, I don't like it. I, I disagree with you, Tony. Totally. I think it's true. Like, yeah, so you disagree? It is, it's you easier disagree? to. Yeah, I think it is easier just to use common parlance to to yeah. get to where you want to be. You know, and, to, and I, I think. It, do you want to define your terms? Can we, can we define our terms quickly? What I mean by postmodernism, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe we're using the term differently, yeah? Because you're describing to me in societal terms how postmodernists manifest. 
I don't care so much about that. I care about defining a quarter. To me, a postmodernist is someone who thinks human beings are a blank slate. Can you remind yeah? me again, what was the thing that he... He, it the was within the context. Because I remember hearing it, I just can't remember. It's exactly. the eternal battle of trying to pin down the objective truth of statements. So when you ask statements like, do you believe God exists? That predicates on an assumption that God can be stuck into an objective, logical box. And those of us who believe that God is... When, we pray, when you pray in Islam, you say there is always something higher. I think you say. God is the highest. Yeah, well, there is something above. So I assume that God is beyond, ineffable and beyond my understanding. Transcendent, yeah. Yeah, transcendent, yeah. And that therefore I don't expect to be able to fit God and various other concepts so, so, into a box. There's a slight nuance here. Yeah. So we're not supposed to reflect about God because you cannot grasp God's essence but we're supposed to reflect upon the creation of God because we can so we can ontologically affirm that there is a God there is a creator there's one worthy of worship but the actual essence is beyond us so when someone is asked so this is why I believe when when Ijab asked that question it should have been an, e an easy enough answer I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah. see that kind of... That's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. So, are you a Christian or an atheist, by the way? Especially for someone like Peterson, who is an intellectual. What definition of God is he supposed to be agreeing So, ju just before that, I want to know, are you an atheist or a Christian? I'm actually religious. You're religious. So, it seems to be, like, maybe religious people want an answer and... Yeah, I believe in yeah, a deity. I, I, I'm a deist in... Oh, you're Dave. So, so okay. I, I, I you're believe, in, camp, I believe uh, in God, absolutely. I do believe that there's creation, there's a consciousness behind creation. I, I am interested very much in esoteric religion and philosophy, and in Christianity, the way it's manifested in Christianity. Like the Gnostics and. Yeah, kind of. Right. It's only. Um, Sorry, just to answer your question. Yeah? That's Tony, that's Christian. Yeah, yeah. Christian, yeah? yeah? Nice to meet you. So, once again, I think Hijab was right here is postmodernist because both post structuralists and postmodernists have the same notion that reality has no intrinsic nature. That's the notion of the work, the, the, the principle, the word of the philosophy of, right? And then I start talking about everyone has these legitimized narratives to bring forth their uh, uh, narratives. So you're saying that as, as, a will, as a will to power. You're saying that's that's generally, like, no, well, I think that's, that's academic definition. understanding of things. Post structures and post modernists, both of them. I think what post modernists is like second phase of post structures. But what defines post modernists, Mark Foucault and these a lot, uh -huh. is that they are interrogating modern paradigms. Yeah. That's what they do specifically. That's why they're kind of different because post modernists all about modern. And it's like this systematic interrogation of these legitimizing narratives and so on and so forth. So when John Peters is saying, what do you mean by do? What do you mean by you? What do you mean by believe? John Peters is almost saying this statement is illegitimate and let's interrogate, right? Which is very post modernist thing to yeah, do nowadays. Yeah. So I think it is postmodern. You, you could all, you could say until it's on the brink of logical positivism. Because right. you know, remember the logical positivists, they had this idea that if something's not mathematical or mathematically you can show it or empirically, then it's almost meaningless. Right. He's not doing that, but he's close to that by almost saying like, well, we can't really get down to the nitty gritty. Like, what he, what he said is when we get down to, I don't remember his exact words, but believe and uh, the uh, not one other word he mentioned, he said, if we think we can define them, we, we can't, or something like this, he said. Yeah, yeah. and I think you know, language has a meaning, it is so useful, and we've harmonized and, and evolved our language to such a point now, when someone asks, do you believe in God, it's kind of yes or no answer, you know, yeah. and you can, you can drill into the reeds with that, right, but... Yeah, I mean, it, I think Peterson, I think, understands and he will realize that there's a, an inherent a beauty within man and I think it's God-like, if you get things right, a kind of God-like nature in, in humanity itself and the idea of a, a creation that has order, you know, that has a formal order to it and that's what he talks about a lot. Again, of course, I think he believes this stuff. Um, but, but, and I, I get where maybe he doesn't believe in it bearded, white bearded guy. I don't think anybody does. <laughs> well, you believe in objective truth, you believe in objective facts, which um, he but we don't probably dispute. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, th I think graying there, just because the guy used... Okay, so that, that's a good point. Just because okay. the guy used a logical positivist stance for a minute... No, he did. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying he used it. I'm saying he got close to it. 
Yeah, but he's allowed to. It's a tool that you can use. It's just a logical positivist. They use it to the exclusion of all else. That was the problem. Skepticism is a perfectly good tool. It shouldn't be used to the exclusion of all else. You want to use the toolkit. But he didn't answer the question. I know, because the question may in itself be an invalid question. Because it's, 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 you're not no, 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 it's, no, I'm not... No, I'm not accepting that label. My, the way I'm looking at postmodernism yeah. is in the context of human nature itself. And for me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll give you my definition, maybe we need a new world. The world divides into two kinds of people. People who think that human beings are blank slates and people who think that human beings arrive with an a priori nature. Okay? Yeah, that's philosophy, but I don't think... Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. Now, I'll, now I'll map postmodernism into that because postmodernism it sprawls all over the place and I'm not a fan of it, okay? But my understanding is a postmodern position would be, yeah, you're a blank slate. Right? That, that they would engage. Whereas religious people of all faiths and Darwinians, we all believe yeah, that yeah. humans arrive with an a priori nature. Yeah, so to cut through the Gordian knot of this constant talking about sociology and stuff that I really don't care about, okay, so, so, I'm using that core okay. definition. Yeah, so yes. you, made, you made a very interesting point, which mm -hmm. is, interestingly enough, theists and Darwinists believe in, we, yeah, we have an inherent the same yeah, a, a priori beliefs, and then you have the standard social science model, uh, yeah. blank slate model. So, Peterson clearly is using the language of the standard social science model, but the audience that he's pandering to, they believe in a priori beliefs. Yes, so he's allowed to, he's, he's made it no, very, but, very clear. But there's a problem there, isn't there? No, I don't see a problem. He definitely believes in a priori human nature. He believes... Oh, wait, wait, wait. He, you said he definitely believes in that nature. Yeah. Okay. He's not being asked the question, do you believe in a priori I'm nature? Not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not challenging God. you here, but I'm saying... I'm just interested. How, what made you think he believes that? Because I don't I see evidence. Oh, okay. he Everything that. I've ever seen the guy yeah. says confirms that perspective. I think he I has an understanding there okay. of, of, of so, 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 genetics and genes being important in a person's development, and this is obviously no, no, no. That's in that's in regards to the feminism discussions. We're talking about. A prior, like no, for example, no, no, we have no, no, a prior no. belief in God. Like slate that, that means, don't bring God in for the minute. Just on psychology, just the fact. No, that no, of course he has that. If he's got of an a, he if he's that. got an a prior, if he thinks that even so in, in relation to like a blank slate kind of theory of humans and stuff, obviously he, he believes in genes to a point, but he also believes environments very important for humans. Marry, marry those together, you've got basically a template for what a human. Yeah. Is. So look, 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 look he, he believes we have a biological inheritance. We have our yeah. cognitive architecture, yes. which yes. makes women act this way men act that way but when we speak about a priori beliefs as theists we're not referring to those things we're referring to what we call the fitra which we've spoken about i'm not sure if it, uh, you, yeah um Pla plantiga calls it basic beliefs so when we refer to a priori in the context of theism we're not speaking about those biological things because it it's clear he does yes, that. that yeah. That's what he made his career on. Sorry, here's yes. where we disagree. I think you are. I think that this is a synthesis which should be happening and isn't happening, the differentiation. You're standing on common ground, and Muhammad Hijab and Peterson both actually agreed on that common ground. That we're all in a camp of people who are not postmodernists, who don't believe in a blank slate. From that, it logically follows we are people who believe there is an objective truth. Yeah? Just because I can't pin it down, just because you go, do you know what God is? I may not know exactly what the nature of any given objective truth is, but because I'm an a, I have an a priori nature, I can nail down there must be objective truth out there and hopefully objective morality. That's the platform I come from. So the objective truth out there, it depends upon how you define truth because the way he defined it is the story of Cain and Abel, according to Peterson, mm -hmm. would be objectively true. If you speak to an average Muslim or Christian, when they say we believe in Cain and Abel's story being objectively true, they mean literally there was a Cain, there was an Abel. But when he says objectively true, he means it's happening right now. It's because right. corner is happening throughout history. Right. This is and where that's we need issue. again to define our terms and see whether we're going to agree in a differentiation between facts and truth. Nietzsche made this distinction. Um, Peterson would make this distinction and I'm very much with it. There are dead facts which have no values and no meaning. And the minute you add a value to a fact, I would say it becomes a truth. Yeah? It's a personal evaluation. Hence, truth can exist in fiction. Now, the fact that you don't think truth can exist in fiction, I really find surprising. If you've never read a work of fiction where a character did something insightful and it, it, you saw in that, it so revealed to you a truth about human nature. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. 
or Tristan and yourself, right? These stories are they they go around, you know, they're, they're often all over literature. They, they prop up um, in different cultures. Yeah, yeah. so the, the idea of Romeo and Juliet then and the idea of fighting, like two factions fighting just because it's history. It's not particularly progressive and often it can lead to tragedy. So I think that's generally you see that there's a kind of archetypal truth yeah. in that, you know? Look, no one disagrees with that. I mean, right. Brett Weinstein calls religion uh, useful, uh, usefully, uh, I forgot the exact, basically from a pragmatic point of view, literally false, but uh, metaphorically true, right? So no one disagrees with that point, but when it comes to stories like Cain and Abel, one of the lessons from that story, from, from a Quranic perspective, is about not just uh, murder and jealousy and these things, but about the hereafter. But from a from, from a from a from a purely he's not allowed to use a microphone. No, I don't think he is. He realised the place is gone. Oh, okay. So, do, do you see as a Christian as well, or sorry, not Christian as a deist? Do you see th uh, that that element would be missing if you look at it purely from a metaphoric point of view? Can I, can I, I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes, clearly. It would be, but I wouldn't prioritize the objective fact of the thing in the way that you would. Yeah. I under, I'm not naive to the idea that you're going, well, if this happened, then that happened, then hopefully an afterlife and hopefully a whole lot of things I'd thing like you, to happen. Yeah. But you have, say, you know, faith, the idea of faith. You have, like, faith in in Islam, I mean, so there are the concept of faith, right? The idea that maybe these things are kind of unseen, but they can if you listen, if you pay attention, you can grasp, you can get hold of a concept of God that can exist in your daily life, you know? And it can make you a very religious person. And you can begin to see scripture like every, everywhere and learn how to relate properly to other people and your life can really flourish from that perspective. You know, you know, it's... That, as you said, it's important to see there is a beyondness to lots of these stories. That's the power of the archetype. It's the power of the yeah, I, 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 I don't think anybody just I haven't got the answer to the question. Do you split. believe that you can get truth in fiction or not? Yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I'm going to answer what you're saying in a way. So I think there's a split of inherent and in ontology, right? Whereas the Muslims are saying the Quran and the Prophet is everything literally true, right? It's literally happened, yeah. right? I don't care how crazy my sound to you, the Quran is true. Carl Jung can start this idea of synthesizing Christianity with mythology. Because Carl Jung was at a time when Christianity was on a decline, scientism was on a rise, right? And I think he tried to find a way to kind of like help Christianity survive, saying that it's metaphorically true. Which is what you're saying. You're saying something metaphorically true is just as true as it be literally true, right? You're saying something mythological. Yeah, but you're so I, and, I, and I agree with you. And I think it's this whole idea of symbols, right? It came able. What's symbolic about it? Murder, jealousy. Yeah. The, these things are really true. And John Peter is happening today, right now, because these are themes that are perpetually happening, which are linked to the human nature and so on and so forth. Agreed. I think we still even agree on a metaphorical thing as well. But we're taking an extra step, we're going two for it. We're saying it is literally true, right? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of Christians nowadays have kind of let one let go and they're sticking to the metaphor. And there's additional yeah. meaning to that literally. Yeah. There's a lot of difficulty though in assessing whether a lot of these mythological kind of stories actually did happen in real life. The idea of splitting the you know, part of the Red Sea, you know, right. Moses doing all sorts of miracles and so on. I really the Christ that we story. our language here. When mm -hmm. we have the word truth and the word fact. Because we're using the word true in two contexts. Well, the contexts, word truth, in fact, right? are both vacuous no. words. They're very, okay. very I'm defining truth as that which, um, what is it? That which optimizes hermeneutics in accordance with your picture. I've given a very clear definition to you before <laughs> so what that, I'm doing. But that, but that would be a pragmatic. That's very good. Okay, okay. whether it's pragmatic or not, I'm giving a definition. But, but, so just, you could just say the pragmatic. I think what no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't agree with your interpretation that it's a pragmatic framework. I don't think I'm doing I hope I'm not doing that. It's a teleological framework. I think we'll have intuitive understanding. We just agree. The same way we have a truth understand, one second, we have two truth, the same way we say love, right? No one will be able to fully define them, it will always be short change, but we have two to understand what we're talking about when we're using the word truth, right? It's like, what do you call it, the beat in a box, right? So let's not try to define it too much. Let's try no, to... no, no, we have, uh, okay. I, 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 I see what you're saying, but... Okay, we can't go anywhere. If it's true and you've agreed that truth can exist, if it's true, you see the problem. But I said already, if it's yeah. the case yeah. that truth can exist... If it's a fact, that... Yeah, yeah it's fu thank you. If it's a fact... There's that truth can exist in fiction, then it follows that not all 
um, truths exist within the world you, you, of fact. You, you, you disregard word fact. That. You disregard word fact because when you say fact, fact is something that's verified but independently, okay, so right? So that's all you refer to literally true things, right? Your definition. Well, if something's metaphorically true, it is not fact. It might be true to you, it might really be true, but I'm going to verify it. So it's not fact. Right? By the way, he, 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 he doesn't agree. He doesn't agree okay, that a fact is something which is literally true. He takes the view that facts and truths are two different things. And when, when a fact, when something has value, you call it true. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying that there's a fact value axis. Are you aware of this way of looking at stuff? Fact value, right? You have the facts on the x-axis. You have the values on the y-axis. The x-axis is irrefutable. It's definitely factually the case. But it has no teleology. It has no meaning until it's evaluated. What consciousness, God, whatever brings to the table, is an evaluation of dead facts. So, and Nietzsche was totally attuned to this. He says it about coins. He says, facts are like coins which have lost the imprint of their symbol. Yeah? And now they're just base metal. Well, another way of thinking about it is a naturalistic fallacy. Facts don't give you values. These yeah. are these are two different, yeah, right, right. Yeah, two yeah, different. Hume. It's yeah. Hume's fact value thing. Yeah? So when Hume talks about the fact value dichotomy and Hume's guillotine, um, a lot of people seem to accept that now. I I think not. I think that you possibly can. The two are connected intrinsically because they they're both cross-referencing the same primary a priori reality. You need facts and you need values. What we're experiencing right now is an interface of those two things. That's what reality is. And reality is a priori to facts or values. Okay? That kind Say of that off part again. Fact. Okay. Reality, reality is a pri reality is exactly what's happening now. Now is reality. Reality is a priori to facts or values. We're adding the values. The value of the temperature right now to yeah. me as a human being no, 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 is very yeah, different than to another yeah. person. So the values have to be evaluated by each individual. That it doesn't mean they're subjective and wishy washy because each individual also has an empirical nature, an objective nature. Which which will determine how they react to it. So although they're happening subjectively and phenomenologically for each other individually, it doesn't mean they're groundless or wishy-washy, they're not. You are also an object with a nature. You're interacting with objects with a nature. And that's real for you. Yeah, and the way you do it is totally real for you, and there are limits on how you can do it. You can't just choose to suddenly be a giraffe. You can't just suddenly choose to see in infrared. You've been born in a finite limitation, and there is an optimum way for you to interpret the objective reality around you. Yeah. And religion aims you towards doing that optimally. That's the point of religion. So, so, so did, where they disagree? Sorry, it point. doesn't just really just come down to do we believe the things in the Bible or in the Quran as literally as they happen. But we can obviously fundamentally understand that the, the truths in the Quran, in the Bible, yeah. tell us how to live, tell you the seven deadly sins, the Ten Commandments, a very good reference, it's great reference material to, for how to live a good life. I think, the, I think the, the issue is here, obviously Muslims believe in the Prophet Muhammad, everything he did in the Quran, right? Lots of people self say, don't necessarily believe it was entirely true, what happened exactly as it is. Muslims at the first, did, just like in the Testament. It's the same thing, do, do we believe in these stories that are mythological, kind of hard to believe if you live today now with a lot of the understanding of science. So I, I, I disagree with that last part though. If somebody comes from a paradigm of theism, it's not hard to believe in miracles. Miracles are just as remarkable as a leaf dropping from a tree. Because from we it, just don't see them today. <laughs> yeah, well, no, 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 we we, we, we would say we see miracles all the time. Sure. So it depends how you define the word miracle. So there's certain miracles like the parting of the sea that we don't see. When it comes to the miracle of life, when it comes to the miracles all around us, of even for example, um, there's one army which is small and meek and uh, downtrodden and a huge army yeah, and it defeats we would call that a miracle yeah, yeah, as well sure. so no, no. I, would, I, I definitely would i think with respect you're now being you're using a lot of rhetoric here on miracles a miracle would be something which it would assume there are default laws of physics and a miracle will be something Jesus which but the default law of physics. But so the default law of physics no, is no, no, if you stand on water, you sink. So if somebody does something which contradicts the default, I'm not saying whether they can or they can't, but can we agree that if somebody walks on water, we would say that constituted a miracle? Well, you're, you're, you're falling from a tree, maybe no, poetically. No, 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 but look, your definition of miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. 
So you would say there's laws of nature when there's a violation? I'm saying default laws of nature. That's fine. Which means God could intervene, maybe God could intervene. You, you could call it default, you could call it uniform, whatever it is. Laws of nature. And there's a violation. Very human definition. I don't accept that definition. That's not the Quranic definition either. I think the... the so we, the as Muslims, we... The idea that... Do, do you understand it, that your, your definition yeah. that you have is a very human one? It's not a universal one that everyone I know, I accepts. It, so we need to find the common ground as to how we break this down. So, no, but what you said before is that I'm wrong about the definition of a miracle. But the thing is, I'm not wrong because that's my definition and you have your definition. I know. So what I'm suggesting is that clearly we've got a, we've got a definition problem, which is great. Most of the problems in philosophy and talk, um, discussion, they end up with you realise, oh, we're using different definitions. So we need to nail down. Now, when I said, can we agree that there are default laws of nature? That was my best attempt to start to try and find a common ground. Okay, so I think even to his narrative, though, even if you took on his terms, because you're saying a miracle is a suspension of the laws of nature, right? Yeah, and I'm not saying they can't or can't happen. I'm not judging for now whether miracles can or can't happen. Because if they do happen, they will be God intervening against the default. Okay, but we wouldn't say those. But we wouldn't say God intervening. We would say God. It's not like God is absent, and then God intervenes when there's a virgin birth. We would say God is in control throughout the entire universe. That doesn't preclude what I said. That's not a problem. It doesn't contradict anything I said. All I'm saying is, God. But it does, though. The reason it does is because, from your perspective, it's like a clockwork universe. And you have these set laws, and th when there's a violation, that's a miracle, according to you. But the definition I go with is that it's not that there's a clockwork universe with universe, uh, uh, uniform laws, laws of nature, and then there's a violation. It's that every single instant, God is in control. Okay, and I'm saying that we... Do you, see the, do you see the two different yeah, paradigms? I've already harmonized them with this. I'm saying, assume that we go with the Aquinas view that God mediated his creation by creating default laws, then we have no problem. There are default laws of physics. For the minute, I'm happy to accept they're created by God for the purpose of discussion. So we shouldn't have an issue here. Prior to Aquinas, it was believed that God willed every single action. When a leaf fell from a tree, it was because God actually willed it. Post Aquinas, and I think surely Muslim philosophers as well. No, not quite. Okay, well, we're... It's, it's, that's, I mean, there's lots of differences of opinion on this. I can't say they all have the same opinion, but... Um, God's continuously involved in creation. Yeah, for, I mean, the view I hold is yeah. that God is continuously involved in every moment. I'm not saying he isn't necessarily the sustainer of the entire operation. No, but I understand. You're saying he set a system, yeah, he and a when system. the system, when, when he decides to tinker with the system, yeah. you would call that a miracle. I wouldn't say that. I would say God is in control. Well, we both agree that God, for the moment, we both agree that God creates There's a system. There's some absolute madness happening. Yeah? You agree that God creates a system because you think God creates everything, yeah? You believe in the principle of self-consistency and we can easily observe there is a system. There are certainly laws of physics, yeah? So we can see a system here which you believe God made. I'm happy to play with the idea that it was created by God. That is the default and you have examples in your text where the default assumptions of what would happen in that system are changed, like the Red Sea Pass. So now that is a shift of the default assumption and you account for that by going God chose it. Sure, I agree. No, no, I agree. But that doesn't mean I accept the Humean definition of miracle. I didn't. You, you projected Hume to me, I'm not. I'm just okay. No, but but, yeah. but I described your view as human, whether you accept it as human or not. That's not the definition that I accept. Though. I'm not clear where, where I have are we to different. Go in just a sec, guys. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I think it's been a really cool conversation. Um, I just say, like, the, the kind of as I see it, more the mystical, more mystical kind of thing that exists in so many religious books and so on across the world, like, of course. People are going to believe this stuff if there was more evidence for a lot of this stuff. Say a lot of atheists too, um, would believe hey. the same thing. Like, it's not bad, but they were. Um, it's just, it comes down to, I think, again, getting back to Peterson, what can these books tell us? Um, are there, is there something that, that exists in that ar archetypal frame, like the idea of doing good, of the understanding, our conception of good and bad now having been evolved significantly enough so that we have built all of this. Can I explain to you why that's not enough? I agree with the archetype, I agree with, I know exactly what you're saying, whether it's Ganesh or Harry Potter or any, today we could come up with some really good stories and say, okay, these are happening right now, these are the new archetypes. Yeah. Well, human behavior, yeah, right? yeah. So human behavior is governed by pain and pleasure. 
Yeah. And human beings who do not believe in a hereafter, who do not believe there are consequences which involve pain and pleasure in the future, they're less likely to act in a moral way despite all of the archetypes that are around them. I get you. And this is true. You understand? Yeah. That's a huge point. Yeah, that's, yeah. but now that's pragmatism. Now you are using... It's not, no, no, it's not... Pra no. <laughs> that's so no. pragmatic. It's not pragmatic. It's totally pragmatic. It's now, hang on, in the Quran, because I've started reading it, I've no, finished no, the no, return. Just done the return. Oh, which yeah. one? No, just say your piece. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They... They emphasize the motive for why you do the good action, yeah? It's not just doing the good action. They say it's better if you do the good action for this reason than that. Right, exactly. Okay? I totally agree. It's but sometimes okay. you just do it because God told you. Okay, so as a pragmatist, you're going, let's keep everybody acting well, but can we agree on a more idealistic level, because I am an idealist, that we'd like them not only to do the best thing, but to do the best thing for the optimum reason. And there's a spectrum of motives for behaving well, yeah? Okay, so... so so the I'm optimum, not a pra I am not a pragmatist. No, fine, fine. But an, but an optimum reason for you would be very different to me, I think. You try, are you okay? I'm fine. I, I, an optimum reason for me would be one This is an optimum reason to finish on. Okay. This is... The optimum to yeah, yeah. me is that... Well, thank you, Spurs, so much, man. Really nice to talk to you today. Can grab Cheers, man. Are you back next week? Cheers, you can man. maybe... Yeah, I'd like to... Like, this kind of dead, I think. Yeah, it's... Um, can you... Who's are these?